Hello everyone, I'm Thomas Kincaid. Welcome to Ivy Gate Cottage. This historic cottage is where the paintings are born. Ivy Gate Cottage was originally built in 1937 and is one of the finest examples of the California craftsman architectural cottage. Inside this cottage is where I create my paintings and if there is one question I'm asked more than any other, it is how do I do my paintings? Well, in this presentation, we will look behind the scenes and see step by step how the paintings are created. Let's start out by looking at a painting that's almost finished and see how the final detail is done. Well, this is the center of Ivy Gate Cottage. This is where it all happens. This is where the paintings are born. Now, I use very simple materials, and I'm going to try to explain some of the techniques I use, but it's important to realize I don't do things the same way any two different times. Uh, my paintings are not like a recipe that I follow each time the same way. Each one is just a little different. Of course, the first thing I do is put on the apron. Uh, you don't want to be getting paints all over your clothes. My wife has taught me that many times. Now the first question that seems to always come to people's mind is what kind of paints do you use? Basically I use two different categories of paints, although I'm always experimenting with new materials. On my palette is primarily acrylic or vinyl based paints. These are a specialized type of paint that we used to use in the movie business and they are a vinyl paint made for cells, movie cells. Let me point out a few of the basics of how I work that you may not have thought of. For example, now this is a Thomas and Cade painting waiting to happen. And I want to point out what the elements of it are because I've pioneered over the years some different ways to work with oil that are really helpful. One of the primary things is the surface itself. I mount the canvas to hardboard. You can see this is a uh, patterned hardboard backing. Uh, there's many different brand names for the product. Masonite, Prestwood, other brands. Uh, but it has to be untempered and it has to be non-oil injected. It has to be a pigment ready for a water-based surface because you're going to take the canvas and you're going to mount it using water-based glues. I like good old Elmer's or any kind of white glue. I thin it down and mount the canvas with the glue. Now it worked out pretty good today because I happen to have a painting on the easel that is almost finished, but it's right at that transition point between acrylics and oils. I'll show you what I do to make the color sealed from the acrylic as I begin to put oils on a little later. But right now it needs a little more work in acrylics. And I wanna just explain that at this point, in the painting, uh, I'm at the final detail stage or at the point which I call turning on the light. So you'll see a lot of the areas of the painting look completed, but frankly there's a lot of areas that need work. Now as exciting as working with oil paints is, I have found that in some ways it's very limiting. Now the acrylics that I am using are only a preliminary layer. I have yet to experiment with doing the entire painting in acrylics. Uh, the advantage of oil is that I can get texture and subtlety of color that you cannot get through the acrylics. Acrylics are somewhat limited because the colors are bright. Uh, they tend to have a flat look to them as opposed to the depth, the crystalline layering, the jewel-like quality you get with oil. But I find that for detail, these pigments are superior. It allows me to work detail quickly and as you'll see when we start painting, the detail dries almost instantly so you can put the next layer on. Now, vinyl or acrylic paints will dry in a matter of minutes. Now, that is different than oil paints, which often takes weeks to dry. There, the enemy is how long the paints take to dry. So, of course, I have to find ways to speed up the process of drying. But with these paints, it's the opposite. You need to find a way to slow down the process of drying. Now an airbrush is just a tool, a uh, spray gun as I said, that allows compressed air to flow through a nozzle and then by controlling a trigger action you allow a feed 
of pigment or liquid material of any sort you might want to use. This is filled with water. Now as I press the button, you see that air is coming out. I don't know if you can hear that, but that's a nice little bit of air. If you're kind of hot, it feels good uh, to cool yourself with it. But it's a double action airbrush, and as you pull the lever back, you'll see that wet, moist mist comes out. And it allows the pigments to sit on the surface. When the pigment dries, I coat it with water, and I take a single edge razor blade, and it kind of seems like scraping your fingernails on a blackboard, but it really does the trick. You can get all the pigments off, and it cleans the area up a little bit so that I can then mix pigments on there. I use my Kolinsky Sable brushes to mix the pigments on the surface. If I take some red with my white, you can see you get a little bit of pink. You add a little yellow to that. You make it into orange. As you work and mix pigments, that will stay wet only for a matter of a few moments, so I do periodically use this to constantly moisten it, keep it workable. While I'm on the subject of airbrushes, I'll also point out I use fine uh, point airbrushes uh, for detail as well. These airbrushes can actually shoot pigment down to a hairline width. And I've been painting with airbrushes for so many years, starting with my movie career, uh, that you can gain a certain degree of control. And I can get my airbrush right down and paint hairline detail when needed. I find that a painting can get a little bit stiff if you rely too heavily on the airbrush. So I use it for details, accents, and for overall mood only. But there is a lot of uh, versatility to this airbrush because you see that little bowl allows you to mix pigments. And you can see that's a little bit yellow. Then I put some white in there. This is just a, a dab of white again done with the brush. Makes kind of a light colored pigment. And actually I think it needs a little more white. I put that in and maybe even a little yellow off the premixed pigment or the pre-diluted pigment. The reason being the suspension of the pigment in these premixed airbrush colors is very intense, meaning the pigmentation itself. Because what I'm going to do, that becomes my base color and then I'm going to add even a little more white to my primary color. I put the cap on and we are ready to go. I find, if you can see there, I can actually pull make it just a little lighter so that it softens the area. It's so subtle that I don't even know if a camera can pick it up. When you see my techniques of paintings that seem to glow, there's a lot of different techniques I use to create that effect. One of which is the process of, uh, of haloing an edge, meaning I like to create the effect the light is burning out the forms around it. It's a photographic effect sometimes called haloing. And I try to create that on the pigment that I use through the airbrush and also through my oil pigments. Now this tree, for example, is very lit. And I soften the edge through haloing. Okay, on the light posts in particular, you'll see how the effect can really come to life. You bring uh, some of this haloed edge. I play with all kinds of different pigments and techniques, and I'm always discovering something new. You'll see my little sable brush. This is a number four that I bring up to the canvas. And if you can see, for example, the lights in the window need just a little extra pop. So I bring them uh, some pigment, and you can see it here that that little extra bit of pigment creates the sense of glow within the window. As I'm working, sometimes I may want to come back and crosshatch or work over some of the detail I've put down. So when I get to that point, I oftentimes bring out a blow dryer, which I keep handy, and this will actually dry the pigments. Another tool I've been experimenting with is uh, these beautiful wax-based pencils. I find these pencils can come into an area like this and give me a chance to highlight 
or create other detail. For example, if I was going to create the effect of individual brickwork, it's sometimes too time consuming uh, and a waste of effort uh, to try to do it just with the paints themselves because to manipulate a brush into a fine line involves a lot of constant reshaping of the brush. This stays pointed and I draw right in. As I'm adding detail, I'm not referring to any reference material whatsoever. In fact, uh, so much of my work is done from my imagination that I'm just kind of at a point that uh, that as I work the detail out, I'm, I'm just having fun, just playing, uh, getting ideas as I go. One thing I really emphasize with artists is never get stuck in your ways. Uh, you know, I'm an artist, I've been painting in oils for 30 years, and I haven't painted with acrylics or used that technique that I used in the movie industry for years and years, and yet I'm always willing to try something new, and I always learn something new every time I experiment. Now, I'll be painting my entire life. I will never retire from painting. This is something I want to do till the day I die. And I hope that throughout my entire life uh, that I will always be reaching out for new techniques. Our next process is to look at how I transition from the acrylic underpainting into the final rendering in oil. Now, the oil process is where the magic really begins. And uh, if there is any particular talent I have, I think it's in that sensitivity to making the oils create that color atmosphere, that mood, that texture, that vibrance. That's where the light comes in. And we'll look at that process next. Also, a little later, we'll find out how the ideas themselves get from thumbnail to canvas. Next comes the transition from acrylics to oils. And again, to emphasize, the vast majority of my paintings uh, have been done only in oils. It's only recently I've returned to using acrylics as a foundation. And if you're an artist, I've heard so many painters tell me how difficult it is to mix acrylics with oils. Well, it is easy to put oil on top of acrylic, providing you seal the acrylic first. Uh, heck, you don't even have to really seal it. Acrylics are water soluble. The oil pigment and the solvents will not melt the acrylics, but the difference is you cannot put acrylics on top of oils. Uh, acrylics will not bind or adhere to the oily surface. So the first thing I do is create the acrylic layer and then I put the oils on top. Now, to seal my canvas, I utilize um, a commercial grade polymer coating. This is an acrylic spray. Um, any number of different techniques can be used to seal uh, the canvas. You can spray it on with an airbrush using uh, matte medium or some other kind of acrylic coating. I like to use this very tough uh, commercially prepared spray. Now I want to point out something. As I work on the acrylics, the colors go very dry and dull, what we call a matte finish. And the matte finish does not have the luminous quality of color. Now with oils, the varnish and the pigment keeps the colors luminous, meaning your eye sees through the pigment and color refracts back up into the retina. You see it as it goes through layers, much like you would see uh, the color on a rock if you were to wet it. It looks gray and dusty and you wet it and it gets that rich colors. You can see all the pigments. That's because you're seeing through the lens of the water. It makes the color itself appear more vibrant. And that's what varnish does for paintings. And acrylics need to be varnished if you want luminosity and depth to the color. Oils, on the other hand, have a lot of varnish in the pigment itself. And the mediums you use to paint with oils has a gloss characteristic to it. Now, I want you to notice this painting, but as I spray the varnish, you will see the colors get depth and richness and come to life. Now, as you spray, you want to keep the can a good six or eight inches off the canvas. Preferably, you can lay it flat. I'm going to leave it upright so everyone can see. And try not to breathe too much, because uh, it's really not too good for you. Now, as I bring the coating down, you can see the difference in the colors. 
You can see how the colors really begin to take on a vibrant look. As I start the process of transferring to the oil pigments, uh, I oil up the surface. Now this has been sealed with the acrylic, but I oil up the surface utilizing my liquid mixture, the painting medium I mentioned. I take an ordinary paper towel and I just sort of create a surface that has a little bit of tack to it, a little bit of moisture. Uh, this will stay wet for only an hour or so, but it's enough time for me to work into the pigments. Bear in mind, you don't ruin the layer uh, once it is sealed with acrylic. No oil pigment can permeate that acrylic layer unless you scrub awfully hard. So I simply come in and do the oil up, and now I am completely on to the oil painting process. My brushes consist of several types, uh, synthetic hair brushes, soft hair brushes, and blends. This is an example of a synthetic brush. The advantage it has, it will not break off and leave little filaments from the bristle uh, in your painting. Uh, so it is a good brush to use when you are going to be scrubbing into dark areas. You won't leave little bits of lint or filament or hair or dust uh, onto the surface. For detail, we use the sable hair brushes. Again, a Kolinsky sable, similar to the brushes used for my acrylic painting, except that they are long handled. Uh, I've always been very steady uh, with my hand, and if I work uh, certain details, I want to go towards the end of my hand. And you can see here how I will actually manipulate the brush. I'm left-handed, and I can create strokes with dexterity from the end of the brush. On the other hand, sometimes you want to get up real close as well. Nothing can beat oils. No computer program, no high-tech wonder can beat good old-fashioned oils. And at heart, no matter how many experiments I make with new materials, new techniques, new technology, I will always, in essence, be a good old-fashioned oil painter. This is where the true talent of any artist comes out is his ability to envision the subtlety that will bring the painting together. It's like in the movie business, a lot of people can shoot a lot of footage, but it's in the editing that the nuance and the brilliance of the uh, storyline is brought out. Uh, the characterization, the mood, really becomes apparent as the final touches are put into the project. And as a painter, that's the process I'm most particular about. The texture I put on also adds the element of what I like to call the rustic quality. You know, you get a sense uh, in these old manor houses and cottages and gardens and so forth that I paint that the pigment almost simulates some of the old weathered stone. And I love the idea that the um, texture will create an illusion of the third dimension that makes it feel as though that stone is real. Well, the fun is just beginning. I'll spend hours upon hours putting all the final details in the oil painting itself. And when it goes to print, the final result is a Thomas Kincaid studio work, hand finished by me with all the detail you've come to expect. A lot of processes, however, get us to this point. I'm often asked, how do you get your ideas? Let's take a look at that process right now. Well, before an artist can paint, he has to draw. At least that's the way I think about it. Because you see, drawing is foundational to getting an idea down on paper. Now, I started drawing when I was three or four years old intensely, and I mean intensely. I seemed to never have uh, a day go by that I didn't have a pencil in my hand most of the day. My mother tells stories that I could draw before I could walk. And I will tell you that it is necessary to have paper and materials with you at all times because you never know when an idea is going to come. And inside here are where the ideas are born. In fact, I was just sitting at a chapel service this morning sketching this 
picture of a lake with a moonrise over it. Uh, you never can tell where ideas are going to come from, so you always have to have your notebook at the ready. I keep this one with me everywhere I go. I have a secondary one, a series of secondary ones that I use. This one I love because it looks like a hymnal. You just never know where ideas can come from. I subscribe to half a dozen pictorial magazines. I'm constantly photographing and sketching out of doors. I'm seeking out new places for inspiration as I travel. God can touch your heart with an idea somewhere where you least expect it, and who knows where it can come from, so I'm always on the alert, have my radar out. This idea is an example. Uh, will serve to illustrate the next step. Now, once I take that sketch with me, uh, uh, from my sketchbook rather, uh, and I enlarge it here. Then the next step is I may want to do a little more sketch development. I like to iron out as many of the details as I can. So I will put the sketch on this tool, which is called a light box, and then I'll take a piece of fresh clean paper, lay it on top of that, along with some light tack masking tape. And then if you can see here, I'll turn on the lights extra bright we can see the sketch and I can begin to draw on top of the projected image or the traced image rather that I see. Now in this case I may want to develop it into light and shade so that I begin to analyze what I'm going to do in the final painting. I'm just looking for patterns now of light and shade. There are artists who like to take their sketches to a full rendered state and there are assistant artists you can get who specialize in doing what's called layout work and a number of professional artists that I know use these kind of services. It's a way to take your drawing and elaborate it a little bit much like an architect would take his initial sketch and hand it to what's called a draftsman and the draftsman would elaborate on it and do more detail. It's just you take the bare bones and flesh it out just a little bit. Uh, Norman Rockwell would spend as much time oftentimes on his drawings than he would on the final painting. Well, this just doesn't work for me typically. I change so much in the final painting and I like creativity to be present at every step. Now, I have experimented with using sketch artists and, and layout people and, you know, they can provide a little bit of help, but I've found there's nothing like seeing an idea in your head and letting it germinate every step of the way. Uh, only then can you be open to God's leading because you don't want to pin things down too much, I think, or else you'll spoil the spontaneity and the guiding of God's Spirit. Now here's another trick I use. This is uh, what is called matte finish acetate. Now this is another tool I use. When I'm doing a sketch, sometimes I will make a thumbnail, enlarge it, and then put matte finish acetate. It's absolutely transparent. And you don't need to use the light box then. And I can sketch over it to refine my detail just a little bit. Now the goal of getting your drawing detailed like that is so that you know where you're going with the final painting. Oftentimes, I have to come back and do specialized drawings uh, like this. Now, this is the actual detailed drawing I did to develop the boating characters that would be used in my painting of Venice. Now, you can see a lot of detail went into planning the waves and the people and the perspective of the boats as they go off into the distance. Uh, this is a useful tool and every artist has different planning techniques that you use. I am always trying new ways to cut the process down to manageable uh, little blocks. I want each painting to be the best it can possibly be. And if there's ways, techniques that I can use to help me in the process of getting the image I have in my mind onto canvas, then I will use them. Of course, another challenge an artist has is how do you then take your sketch and get it up onto the canvas? I have for years used a technique where I'll take my sketch and shrink it or reduce it either mechanically by hand or with a Xerox machine and then take that, put it into a projector. The projector can blow it up onto the canvas and you can then do a tracing from that. That is called uh, a lucigraph or an artograph. There's a lot of different machines that do that. Norman Rockwell was known to use that technique. In fact, he would use photographs which were enlarged in this way and uh, he was always a little embarrassed about that process. I like to work from my sketches so if I take my sketch and can find a simpler way to enlarge it I will do it. Now for example I can take a sketch like this uh, which is a sketch as an example 
uh, of a recent painting of mine, the Aspen Chapel, and I can take something like this and actually put it into a computer where you can scan the sketch and then output it from the computer on any size paper you want. It's almost like a desk jet printer, but much larger, and I can output it onto paper or I can output it directly onto canvas. Now I've experimented with that in several paintings and it's wonderful. It allows me to take the source material and avoid the process of having to hand enlarge it. Again, an example of technology serving the artist. Well, I suppose the best place to finish the tour of my creative process is right here. This is my art library and surrounding me are thousands upon thousands of volumes that document the work of the great painters of the past. Now I have spent countless hours in here with my magnifying glass studying the paintings of my heroes, the great masters of the past, many of which are completely obscure today. We find as you look through the history of art that there has been the emergence of a tradition of passing down the flame of inspiration and techniques and craft from one generation to the next. I find that amazing and I'm excited to participate in the process. In fact, from day one in my publishing career, I have been involved in helping to nurture the next generation of artists. I suppose it all began with my use of the apprentice system. Our apprentice artists do finish work on every Thomas Kincaid canvas print. Now, these paintings are time consuming to work on and yet these artists are diligent uh, with specialized paint mixing and paint drying techniques that allow them to hand finish each work uh, one by one. But I suppose the ultimate expression of the apprentice system or the master artist so to speak passing on his ideas and techniques is in the development of a studio. Now if you look back over the history of art, the atelier system or the studio system was foundational to the development of Western art. The great Leonardo da Vinci, perhaps the greatest genius of all time, apprenticed under a little known painter by the name of Verrocchio and Leonardo was said to have painted an entire figure in an altarpiece from the Verrocchio studio. What fascinates me personally about this entire process of the apprentice and master system is that in the passing on of techniques and taking artists under your wing, you have the chance to actually get new inspiration and new excitement for your own work. Uh, I would like to be remembered as someone who really cared about the process of art, about the process of learning to draw and paint. But beyond that, I'm very excited about Thomas Kincaid Studios, which is our newly formulated system of working with other artists. Uh, now through the years we have worked with so many talented people who've helped expand my creative process. Uh, of course the apprentices who work on my paintings and do the final highlighting. We've also had designers and graphic artists who've worked with us in the development of our products and sculptors and creative craftspeople who work to create the three-dimensional works based upon my paintings. But now the next step for us, which I am so excited about, is working with upcoming and highly talented artists who desire to work in styles that would complement my own so that we can create new works of the imagination and spread light even more. Well, you don't have to be an art expert to realize that a lot goes on behind the scenes in the creation of a work of art. It's like a movie. You direct the lighting, you get your cast of characters, you assemble the composition, you do the editing, and you finalize it. Uh, in this case, the artist can do all these processes by himself or in collaboration with other talented people as he desires. But there is a fascinating creative dimension to the making of paintings. It starts with memories, with sensations, with sensitivity to the world around you. And somewhere in the process, God infuses his light, his love into that painting, and it can reach out to bless many, many people. This is Thomas Kincaid, thanking you for sharing the light.